Jesus is someone I pray to. Well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Um, and he, to me, is the like symbol of just ultimate forgiveness and ultimate love. He's sort of that like constant figure in my life. Jesus is also Isa in Arabic, and he was a messenger as well. He was just extremely enlightened, like religiously and morally. He was somebody that um, just tried to um, impart wisdom on others and um, make the world a better place. I think he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and still don't see in others. And I, I think that's just a lot of love and, and hope. Jesus sort of seemed like an ominous uh, figure. You know, he just, he, he was God and it was hard to relate to him. But I think as I've grown in my faith a lot, I've really started to see Jesus as my closest friend. So as Brianna gets ready for the other video, it's just crazy to hear these people like, one person said he's just the man, other guy said he's not the son of God, and it's like, to us, like, Jesus is like Jesus, like, that's our Lord and Savior. The other people, this is just, so that was really eye-opening for me. Um, but here to the next video. Who do you believe Jesus to be? In fact, it was a question so important that while Jesus himself was here on earth, he asked that question to, the, to those closest to him. After ministering for some time, Jesus gathered his closest followers together, and he said, hey guys, can I ask you a question? Are people getting it? Are people understanding who I really am? Do they understand me to be who I'm telling them that I am? And those closest to Jesus said, well, Jesus, we don't have to tell you this. People think a lot of great things about you, but no, they're not getting it. They don't really believe that you are who you claim to be. And then Jesus locks eyes with his closest followers, and then he says this, what about you? Who do you say that I am? What about you? Who do you say that I am? Church, that is a question that echoes through history right down to you and me. Who do you say Jesus is? So before we talk about what he just stated, I want to start from the beginning. So Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was, he's all man, spirit, and God at the same time. All modern scholars of rank agree that Jesus existed historically. So it, be, besides all that we know Jesus as, like our Lord and Savior, historically it is proven that Jesus existed. Like, he was real, he was born, he lived here for 33 years. Like, it's facts. Um, and he was a Galilean Jew who was circumcised. He was baptized by John the Baptist, he began his own ministry, and was often referred to as a rabbi. Jesus debated with fellow followers on with fellow Jews on how to follow God. He healed people, he taught in parables, and gathered followers. As he got older, he lived 33 years, but at the end of his life, he was arrested and tried by the Jewish authorities. He was turned over to the Roman government and crucified on the order of Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect of Jerusalem. Jesus was literally not found guilty. I just processed this today about like, he was, as we know that he died on the cross for our sins, but like him dying on the cross was like, he wasn't guilty. Like literally, they literally tried this man for nothing. Like he, the man who next to him was like a murderer, like he was a terrible person, but these people said, no, crucify him. And that's just crazy to me. Um, so he's found not guilty, but was still sentenced to death. Jesus holds significance because of his perfect life and because when he died, he resurrected and left his Holy Spirit. Um, it's just so beautiful that the significance of his life is so powerful, and not just because, because of his life, we have life, but because he lived a perfect life. If Jesus had sinned, it would have been not the, it just wouldn't, it, he couldn't have sinned. So it's beautiful that because of the life he lived, because of his perfect life, we um, now have the Holy Spirit and we have new life. As you know, he was born to Mary and his father is, is God in heaven. So when Mary was pregnant, he was impregnated by the spirit. So with us as humans, like obviously it takes a man and a woman, but Jesus, it took well, this woman and well, really the vessel. Mary was simply a carrier. She didn't do any work in this situation. It was simply just her being the carrier. 
um, and she was a virgin, and that needed to be clear. So that was clear that Jesus was of with clean flesh, that there was no mixing. Daddy, I spoke to Daddy earlier about how us as babies, like when we were born, our our DNA doesn't mix, our blood doesn't mix with our, our mom. So the significance of Jesus being born of a virgin, and again, him being in, Mary being impregnated by the Spirit. So as we saw in the video, the conversation that Jesus had with the disciples and the scripture, it's the story is accounted three times, but the story in Luke, which is one of the gospels, I think it does a good job at explaining this, this situation. It says in Luke chapter nine, verse 18, once when Jesus was praying by himself, the disciples joined him and Jesus asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, and still others that one of the ancient prophets has come back to life. So this is what the people are saying. The disciples are like, yo, Jesus, the people saying that you're an ancient prophet. Some people are saying you're John the Baptist. Like, th this is a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. It's kind of like a celebrity. Like, if Beyonce was talking to her crew, and they're like, what are the people saying, like, in the streets? Because, like, as you guys know, Beyonce, she don't, she's not on Instagram for real. She's, like, you know, in her own world. So Jesus is asking the disciples, what are the people saying about me? And again, as I go on, you'll realize that Jesus, of course, knew who he was. He didn't need the disciples to tell him. Being divine, he already knew what the disciples thought. But Jesus, as you see in throughout scripture, Jesus often asks questions to teach and make people think. He would often answer with a question, leading people to find answers. So as we go on in the scripture, he then asks, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered said, and said, the Christ sent from God. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell this to anyone. He said, the human one. I must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Jesus said to everyone, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves. Take up their cross daily and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will save them. What advantage do people have if they gain the whole world for themselves, yet perish or lose their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the human one, Jesus, will be ashamed of the person when he comes in, the, in his glory and in the glory of the Father and one of the holy angels. So the scripture is so powerful because it's literally telling us, it's really mapping in a way our Christianity, our salvation. It's, it's saying that all who want to come after me must say no to themselves. This is, this is, this is him literally telling us what we need to do as believers. Um, and it's just beautiful that, again, Jesus knew Jesus knew what the people were saying. Jesus knew what the disciples thought were thinking of him. But he lacks these questions um, so that we could question ourselves. And they were led to think about their situation. They were led to think, okay, really, I'm a disciple, but do I really believe? Do I even know who this man that I'm serving is? We have to keep in mind that these disciples were literally, like, just out here. This man was... One of the, like most of the disciples were fishermen. He was fishing. He was living his best life, you know, getting paid. And all of a sudden, this man comes and is like, "Follow me. Drop your fish and come with me." So it's not like Jesus knows all things, but we don't know all things. So when we read the scripture, we have this understanding of, "Oh, we know how this ends. We know, you know, he's coming back. It's a wrap." But in the Bible, they didn't know what was happening. Like they were living it just like, like this was their life. Kind of like a movie. Like when you're watching a movie, you have no idea how this is going to end. But obviously the actors in the movie, obviously the director, the people who wrote the movie, they're fully aware. So just like in this movie analogy, the disciples didn't know. So they had to be, this was God, Jesus' opportunity to be like, hey, you're serving me, but who am I really to you? Um, and that's my question for us tonight, truly, is for us to really question who is Jesus really to us? And if we have an answer, that's great. But making sure that this answer that we have is reflected in our lives, is reflected in what we say and what we do, and making sure that we don't just say Jesus is our Lord and Savior, but really like who he is. So there are some scriptures that I want to share with you tonight on the things that Jesus gives. So I've told you who he is. We know that he is our Lord and Savior. He's our king. But we want to know what Jesus gives to us. What has his life, the life that he lived, what do we have now because of that? The first thing that Jesus has given us, oh, it's there, yay, thank you, Bree. Um, the first thing that he gives us is salvation. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
And that is salvation. It is, it is saying that if we confess with our mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And obviously, in other scriptures, I didn't note it here, but being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that is also a part of salvation. Um, speaking in tongues, well, receiving the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that is a part of salvation. So because of Jesus, we have that chance of salvation. And all of us in this room, glory to God, we have been baptized, we have spoken in tongues, and we have that. We have that assurance that we will see him one day. Um, the second thing that Jesus gives is wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, it says, tell, it tells us what we find is what God gives. It says in chapter 2, verse 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. In other words, the wisdom we need does not rise up from within us. It comes down from the wise God above as we seek him out. So the more that we seek God, God isn't going to leave us hanging. Like if we're seeking after him, if we're reading our Bibles, if we're praying, if we're staying in worship and devotion, he's going to answer our cries. And I think a lot of the time we complain like, oh, I can't hear from God. I can't. But so most of the time it's because we're not giving our all. And if, if anything, we may pray one day and then we're like, oh, he didn't he talk to me, so it's over. But like in any relationship, it takes time. It takes time to get to know his voice. It takes time to be able to indicate is that him speaking or is that myself speaking? Is that the enemy speaking? Um, so it, it takes time, like in any relationship. But again, Jesus brings us wisdom. The, the wisdom of God is truly powerful because I was telling mommy how literally the word of God, the, the world is anti literally the word of God. The things that the world is telling us to do is literally the opposite of what scripture says. The world tells us that obviously you should put yourself first, amen, for self-care. But at the same time, the scripture office says for us to, to help the people around us and to help carry people's crosses. But in the Bible, you, I mean, in the world, it's like, nah, fend for yourself. It's a, a dog eat dog world, it, you know. And that, but that's not that's not what Jesus wants. Jesus wants us to be there for our friends, to be there for our fellow people in the, in the church and in, in daily life. Um, so it's just important that we we seek wisdom. I we went to a service a couple weeks ago. And he, the, the man was saying, what the speaker said, that what keeps marriage is not just love, but knowledge and wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And also profound to me because I think we think love is this, like this, the thing that sustains everything, sustains relationships. Um, but it, it isn't. Even in our relationship with Jesus, it's not going to be love that keeps it. It's going to be your reverence and your respect for him and the knowledge and, and the sovereignty that we understand. And again, the fear of God. I think the word fear sounds like, oh, I'm scared. But no, it means having a reverence for God. And that's what's going to keep your relationship with him. Because you may not love all that this relationship requires. At the end of the day, there are boundaries in our relationship with Christ. That's why a lot of people don't want to be Christian. A lot of people are like, nah, I'm going to just do what I want. But I'll pray to him when I feel like it or when I need a blessing. But a lot of people don't want to really be a Christian because there are boundaries. There are things you should not do as a believer. And no one wants to hear that. That's why the kids just be drunk and they be trying to leave the house because they don't want to be told to come home at 12. No one want, nobody want, people like, people like freedom. But the beauty of this relationship we have with Jesus is that the free, we, we're not, we don't lose freedom, but we gain freedom. We really do. It doesn't seem like it, but we gain freedom in him. We gain we gain a true understanding of his love. And it does seem kind of not like freedom, if you think about it. Like, you can't do certain things. But, again, his the boundaries that we have, the restriction is really protection. And I've had to learn that, especially, like, as a pastor's kid. Because I'm not going to argue. Like, I, you know, there's no point. So I just had to learn that these boundaries that have been set is really for my protection. So again, by having a relationship with Jesus, we find wisdom, we find knowledge, and it's all in his word. It's all in his word. All that we need is in his word truly. And then from the word, he gives us revelation. He gives us understanding. The third thing that, um, that, this, that Jesus gives is friendship. In John chapter 15, verse 14 through 17, it says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. Jesus is our friend because he bears our burdens and sorrows. You are my friends if you do what I command, the scripture says. So I think it's I, it's beauty, beautiful. Again, this whole relationship we have with Jesus because in other religions, they don't call their, their master friend. They call him 
like my master, my savior, they bow. He's simply, he's their king, like it's a wrap. But we have this beautiful thing that we can call our savior, our friend. We can call my, our, our, he's our brother. He's, he's whatever we need and he's made himself available to us. And we don't, like the song says, we don't have to slay the lamb anymore. We don't have to put the blood on the door because someone has taken the place of the lamb. And he's the, like, that's the song, but that's like the, the truth. Like we don't have to slay the lamb anymore. We don't have to put the blood on the door. Someone has taken a place of the lamb and he's the great I am. And it's like we sing that, but it really just click. Like, really and truly, we don't have to do this stuff anymore because of Jesus and because we have a friend in him. Just like the other song, what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Like, oh, what needless pain we bear because we don't carry to him in prayer. Like, these songs are literally the truth. And they're not just songs, but they're scripture. And I think it's just so beautiful that Jesus gives friendship. He gives us love. And Jesus, he knows that there are going to be lonely moments in our life. Like, there's people are so fickle people change and he knows that we that we will need a friend you know he knows that he we that we're human and we don't just like being told do this Mayo, do this israel but he knows that we need a friend like hey Mayo, you know i know you're struggling with this but you're gonna be okay like god is there to comfort you he feels the pain that we feel and that's why him coming down him being a man him being revealed as jesus um was so important because he would be able to feel because he was human so we can't the other like religions and stuff they can't say that like their savior died on the cross for them like jesus literally we have him as an example like we he was a human being so we're like oh wow like he went through pain he went through betrayal these people literally betrayed him literally one week they were literally like hail him go him yeah 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 and then the next week was like kill him kill him kill him so we are able to be like oh jesus went through that he understands when i'm praying to him I'm not praying to this guy in the sky that's just sitting up there on a on a throne, but I'm speaking to someone that understands, that felt the pain, that felt the betrayal. So he really, Jesus really gives friendship and he gives companionship. Again, like he knows that no one, he doesn't want us to be alone, just like you know he gave Eve to Adam because um, he knew that man shouldn't be alone. So tonight we have friendship because of Jesus, true friendship. You know, people like, humans are cool, you know, but humans are fickle. Humans change. Humans, you know, have bad days. Humans get annoyed. Humans don't want to talk all the time. Jesus always wants to talk. Jesus will always listen. And he may not talk back to you the way, like, Bree will talk back to me, but he's there, and he gives a peace and a comfort that Bree would never give me. Not because she's not amazing, but because she didn't create me. See, that's the beauty of our friend being Jesus, because he made us, so he understands our true desires. No matter how deep in a friendship you get with someone, they'll really never deeply know you because they didn't create you. So being friends with Jesus is super cool, and that's what he gives us. Number four, eternal life. The scripture says in John chapter 5, verse 24, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Eternal life is, it's, I'm going to keep saying beautiful because everything just in this whole like in all this studying, it's, it's a little stressful, but it was beautiful to just see what God, what Jesus gives us. And eternal life is truly, I mean, it's the end, like not the end, but it's the, this is the life that we're living is our goal after this. Like we're only going to be here for like a good, hopefully hundred years. And then the next step is eternal life with Jesus. So that's one of the other most beautiful things about what Jesus gives us is that we have a hope that when this life is over, we're going to see each other again, we're going to be in heaven, and we're going to be able to worship our God forever and ever. And eternal life is not just beautiful for us, but it gives us peace, um, especially with, like, especially since we were, like, losing a Sean, it gives us peace that we will see him again. You know, I think that's what, what, that's just the beauty of it, because if we didn't have hope, like, when people passed away, it would be, like, we would be hopeless. Like, we'd be, like, yeah, so, like, our crying, like, the pain we felt with him passing was like painful, but imagine that we had no chance to see. Like it was like we never gonna see him. Like it's over. Like every moment. But we, because of Jesus, we have a chance to see him again. We have a chance to hug him. Maybe not like how we are hugging and like, you know, how we hug now. But we do have a chance that he. Even if we don't see him again, we're gonna. We know that he's in an eternal place that has no more pain, that has no more sadness. Um, because we really don't all understand what this afterlife is going to look like. But we know that heaven is a place, hell is a place, and we have hope to have eternal life. And again, 
the scripture says, I want to repeat it. Whoever hears my words and believes him, which is Jesus, who sent me, has eternal life. He does not come to judgment, but is passed from death to life. Which is so cool because you think like when someone dies, death is over. But really, it's death to life. It's a new life. And that's what Jesus gives us. Number five, Jesus gives us refinement. The scripture says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 2, And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. For context, a refiner is a person, device, or substance that removes impurities, sediment, or other unwanted matter from something. I think of the the refiner thing is super cool because I know some of you may know the song Refiner by Maverick City. Like I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take take whatever you desire, Lord, fill my life. And it's super cool, but like a refiner like burns you. Like it's 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 a burning. So that song sounds cool, but you're really saying, God, burn me, burn my impurities. And like burning isn't fun, you know? So we're singing this song, but really we're, we're asking the Lord to burn us, to burn the thing within us that doesn't give him glory. And the cool thing, I heard a preacher say this, that a refiner is done with such, it has to be done so precisely because if you burn it too much, it could be over, like it's ruined. Like whatever they're refining, like you're gonna mess it up. So the person who's refining it has to bring it to the heat just enough. And if you do too little, the job isn't going to be done. It's not going to be refined. But if you do just enough, you're refined, which gives me comfort because I love that this is the example that's used in Malachi, that Jesus, he knows us. So he knows how much we can handle. And even that scripture of, like, the Lord won't give you more than you can bear, I realize that it's really more of what he, like, we we can't bear a lot if we think about it. Like we're not as strong as we think. So when he says that, what I've gathered is it's really he won't give more that he can carry us through, which means we can bear it all then. If that's the case, if God can hold us through it all, that means we're, whatever He, whatever we face, we're going to be straight because we're not bearing whatever it is alone. So whether it be death, whether it be financial situations, God won't give us more than he can carry us through, which, again, is anything. So I, we have comfort tonight that he can hold us through it all, that he, we're not in this alone. And back to the refiner, that he won't let us go through anything, you know, any situations of fire, of pain, of anything that we, he, he won't let us be hurt. He's never going to put us in something that, you know, is going to, you know, not to say kill, that's a little dramatic, but that, you know, will hurt us in a terrible way. But again, at the end of the day, he has also given us free will. So you may think, oh, well, I almost died from this, or I'm in this situation, or now I have a baby, or so why would God let this, or now I have this. But real ultimately, though, we do have free choice. So if something does happen, the free will, you know. But again, God is still so gracious that even in our mistake, even in our dirtiness, he's still there. He's still wiping off the dirt. He's still wiping off all the things that we did, which is crazy. Because, like, imagine God literally told you, bro, don't do this. This is going to hurt you don't do it and then you do it and then he's still there to be like all right come on I got you I'm gonna still give you my love I'm still gonna walk you through it I'm still gonna I'm still gonna take care of that child I'm still gonna take care of that marriage even like when people get married to people they shouldn't get married to and they get married but God still blesses their marriage God still makes them like you able to have children like that's crazy because of his grace and his mercy so even in our finding we just know that he he's burning the impurities to make us better. He's, he's not removing the good things. He's removing the impurities, the things that are unwanted and things that shouldn't be within us to begin with. And our last thing that Jesus gives is peace. He's the prince of peace. The scripture, John chapter 14 says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Jesus is not a friend, but he, Jesus is not just a friend, but he's our savior and king. And we lack fear, and I think what I said earlier about we lacking fear and reverence for him, all that we should do is, all that we do should give him glory. But again, with the peace, I think, I think that's been the most significant thing that Jesus has, obviously, everything I said is of importance, like salvation, wisdom, um, friendship, eternal life. 
yes, refinement. But peace, I think, is one of the things like on earth that has been so significant because our life is full of chaos. Even if like your personal life isn't full of chaos, the world itself is ever changing. There's a new president every four years. Bills still gotta be paid. Your car may stop in the middle of the road. People are annoying. Like there's a lot of negative things in life sometimes, but we're able to walk through all of it with peace, which is insane. If you really think about it, it's very insane. If you really think about being able to be in like the worst situation ever and still have the peace of God, that's literally not human. Like that's not that's not something that's normal. You know, like something crazy could be going on and you're like chilling. Like if you think about the story of Jesus on the boat. And, like, they are about to drown. Like, y'all, they're in the middle of the ocean. Jesus is sleeping. He is chilling. They could literally die. Like, this is about to be wrapped. He is snoring. And that's why they were so mad because they're like, yo, Jesus, what are you doing? <laughs> Wake up. Like, what do you, like, what, do you not care? Like, I would be like, so, Jesus, you don't care about me. This is what I'm gathering is that you don't care if you don't write, <laughs> nah. I mean, see, that's faith. I love that. Nah, we shaking. But again, that's beautiful, though, Danny. That I think maybe I don't know if any disciples were chilling too, but ultimately, we can be like that. We can be like Jesus, sleeping on this boat of life, chilling. We really can. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. It's not normal. Because then, not only, so let's say you are chilling, right? But then the people around you are going crazy. So it's just like you're dealing with the craziness and then the craziness of the people. Because they're like, Jada, why are you chilling right now? Like, we really, like, even COVID. Like, when COVID was happening, we, we thought we were about to die. Like, COVID was scary, yo. COVID was scary. We were wearing masks. We were locked inside. And the fact that we had any peace, that's crazy because nobody knew what this thing was. We couldn't see it. And that's how you know God is real. Because everybody was scared of this imaginary, like we can't see COVID, but you can catch it. And that's how you know God is real because we can't see God, but hello. Okay. So the point is that we were at peace because of God, because we knew that, you know, they had plagues before. You know, we're we going to be okay. But again, that only came from God. And not just that, like, just his Holy Spirit, like, I mean, this peace is so significant because so many things are happening, and there's so much uncertainty. Our life is literally uncertainty after uncertainty after, like, we just don't know. We literally don't know if we're going to get home safely. We don't know, like, sometimes, like, you're, if you're like, mostly have jobs, you know, if the, he- the check is really going to hit. Like, we really trust in these, these business people because they really could just not let it hit. Like, they said they're going to pay you, but... I mean, there could be a glitch in the system. <laughs> right. But we have so much faith in these business people that they're, but we trust them. We have faith like no other. I remember Felicia, when I think it was Panera, they were not paying her. You remember? Yes, they were not paying her. But we were chilling. Be- well, she wasn't chilling. She, I don't think you were. Ch- yeah, she was. <laughs> she, <laughs> yeah, it actually, she wasn't chilling. But she couldn't even chill because she knew of it. Well, she didn't know. Never mind. She didn't know if she was going to get paid. But ultimately, she really. <laughs> but the point is, is that we don't know. We really don't know a lot of stuff. But we can walk through life with peace because we know who our king is. Like, we know that we're walking in with, like, we have, like, God. Like, it's like you go into a fight. I didn't fight in school. But if you did fight and you're, like, it's like your little sibling. It's like Zay about to get a fight at school and she had to come. Jada is going to be chilling because Jada's here. Like, whoever tried to hit me, Jada got them. Like, she's going to swing all of them. Like, it's going to be not that I endorse violence. We, I, don't, I don't endorse violence. However, if Zayze was in a very bad predicament, Jada would be there. You know, so Zayze would be really chilling because he probably going to sit down. He really, he's he not going to fight. Don't worry. Exactly. Don't worry about his, hello, don't worry about his sweetheart. Like, we, that's, how we, that's how we would be, and that's how we should be. And that's why, like, I really, I think the last, like, last year I really struggled with just anxiety about life because I was really, like, just scared about what was about to happen in my life. And then I had this moment, and I, and I really felt like God questioned me, like, um, first of all, the scripture says, do not be anxious for nothing. 
So you first of all, you're disobeying me. You're doing exactly what I said not to do. I literally told you not to be anxious, and yet you are here anxious, <laughs> literally. So first of all, you're disobeying me. Two, what is this fear doing for you? Like you being scared, it's holding you back, and it's not changing the predicament. Like you being scared, like for me, my current predicament, you being scared not getting into this college, you already submitted the application, sis. Like there's really nothing you can do but just sit and wait. You know what I mean? So, and pray. Yes, for prayer. Um, so that's why we just have to really just be at peace. It's not, like, it's hard. You know, God knows all these things are challenging, but it's possible through him. And I think that's another issue that we have. Is we try to do things in our own strength. We try to figure it on our own. But the scripture literally says, lean not on your own understanding. And we have to literally, like, that was my lock screen for a little bit because I was really leaning on my own understanding. And I don't have that much understanding. So it's like, what are you leaning on for real? Like, you're really leaning on foolishness if you think about it because again going back to even the scripture about like our righteousness as a filthy rag like whatever good that we think is within us is literally nothing like that's why we have to remain humble we have to remain submitted to him because literally he is jesus and we're not like we he's he's god and we're not and we don't know the end from the beginning but he does so that's why we can have peace because he knows it all and we don't that's what it comes down to like with even the questions that we do have, like, yes, we can, you know, God doesn't, as someone said, you can question God without questioning God. You can have questions without questioning who he is. But even then, as long as, you know, like, as the scripture says that I said earlier, uh, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. As long as we understand what salvation is and the hope that we have for after this life, we should, again, be chill. And making sure that, remembering, though, that we are in the kingdom of God. So our life shouldn't just be just like, oh, we're trying to live to get to heaven. But I, while, we're on, we're, while we're on earth, we should be doing things to bring him glory, to advance his kingdom, and to bring people to heaven. Because there's people who don't know Jesus. Like, as y'all saw in the video, these people saying he just a person. He's just a man. Somebody I prayed to. <laughs> He did say, I don't even know. So there are people who literally do not know him. So that's why, even though we may be chilling, they not chilling. Because where they going is not is not it. So that's why our job is, you know, as young people and as just humans, is to, to get people, to call, to get people to follow Jesus and for our lives to be a reflection of him and for our lives to be a testimony of his goodness. So as I close, I really wanted to share a quick scripture. I, mean, I, read, I shared a lot of scripture. But this is a, a significant story. In Luke chapter 5, verse 18, there was a man who was paralyzed, and he could not walk or get around under his own power. He was completely bedridden. This man had four friends, though, who were very good friends indeed, and they believed that if they could just get their sick friend to Jesus, he would be healed. They knew that Jesus had performed many miracles of, he of healing, so the four friends carried their friend on a mat to the house where Jesus was teaching and captured. When they got there, they found they could not begin to get through the crowds, but they didn't give up. They had faith that Jesus could heal their friend if they could just get him close to Jesus. So they came up with a plan, one that was bold and daring. They took him up to the roof of the house and lowered him through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Let's pause. These friends are some real ones. They literally could have been like, well, the crowd's a little big, you know. I guess he may have to die. <laughs> like, like he, they literally could have been like, well, they could have carried him home and just, they could have prayed at home and be like, you know, hopefully the healing that was there, we can bring it home and, you no. Know. <laughs> no, yeah, they really could have given up, but they didn't. But this, it gets even better, you guys. These friends had gone to extra, extraordinary lengths to bring their paralyzed friend to the Lord. Jesus, Jesus recognized their actions as an expression of their faith. And because of their faith, he told the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. This is a very important lesson for us. This man was not only physically, but spiritually healed by the faith his friends had in Jesus. There are many instances in the Bible where one person is healed because of the faith of another person. These examples teach us that our faith can allow God to work in the lives of others. The story is significant tonight about who Jesus is because it ends with us realizing and me reminding of your, the importance of your circle. 
we're not always going to be, we're never really 100%. We're always just trying our best, trying to reach Jesus, trying to live a life that is pleasing to him. And it's important that the people around you are helping you do that. You know, at the end of the day, we're with each other like twice, three times for the week. But the people that you see more like consistently, those are the people that really matter. And who you are outside of this room, it, it doesn't matter. Like you can come to church all the time and we can clap and sing all together. Yay, yay. But that's not what's going to get you to see Jesus. What's going to get you to see Jesus is how you live outside of this room. Like we can legit pretend like all the time. Like for real, like, y'all don't, y'all, I mean, you are my friends. But, but I mean, you are my friends, but at the same time, like, who I am outside of when I see you, that's what it matters. Like, who you are in your bedroom, who you are in the car is what matters and what is really reflects the love that you say you have for Jesus. So we have all these things that he gives us, which is great, but who, like, what this love, because we're grateful for all these things. Like, we can all agree, these six things, and there's even more things that he gives. This is great, and we love him for that, but what are we doing to show that gratitude? And if we say that we're followers of Christ, our lives should reflect being a follower of him. If you're really a follower of Jesus, then like, what are you doing to show that I'm a follower? Yeah. And I think the reason, and I'm closing, I think the reason that we kind of mix up this whole follower thing is because of like social media. Because a follower on Instagram is not that deep. Like if I follow <sighs> Lady Gaga, I click the button and I go by my base. There's no obligation. So that's why I think when we say we're followers of Jesus, it's like it doesn't hit, you know? It's just like, oh, okay, I follow Jesus, yeah, yeah. But being like a Christian, a believer of Jesus, that's different. Like, you're literally like, it's just it's crazy. It's just different. You're not just following. <laughs> it's not just like, oh, I'm following him. Like, this is, you're not just a fan either. Like, there's really, we just, you're not, you're not a fan, you're not a follower. You're just like, this is your friend, this is your savior, and you're just trying to like please him, and your life should reflect it. Like, I don't know, we're disciples. I guess that's a better word. That's why the disciples are disciples. We're disciples of Jesus. So what we should do is, but even the disciples were flawed, because we got Judas out here, you know, <laughs> betraying him. Then we got Peter denying him three times. That's so crazy to me, because literally he was like, nah, God, I would never do that to you. I would never, I would never. You're gonna deny me. I'm telling you. And what did he do? Deny him. And the thing is, three times. Like I would've. Yeah, I thought after like, I thought after the first time he was like, oh. Oh man. Nah, he denied him three. <laughs> but the beauty of this, that even that betrayal, or him denying him was that the people, when he denied him, you guys, they said, your speech betrays you. He couldn't even deny him for real because the way he looked, the way he moved, we saw you with this man. We saw you post at church last night. We saw you clapping. We saw you, we, like, we saw you, like, we saw you. You can't even lie right now, but he still did. It make no sense. Somewhere in the way, but guys, we gotta be careful. Somehow. <laughs> right, exactly. See, we're never safe, but we're safe in Jesus. Hello. We are. <laughs> we are. And because of him, we'll be smart about what we post because we're like, see? With, hello, look at you, wisdom. Hello, like crazy. So it's just true that we really have to realize that being a follower of Jesus is not just as simple as we do in like now, where we click and follow somebody, but our lives should reflect this following that we say we have. So as I close, I really want us to think of now that we have this knowledge of who Jesus is in a deeper way. What do we do? We should walk with confidence of who he is and what being a Christian really means. I hope tonight that you, when you go home, you're like, okay, I'm a Christian, but, like, am I living like a Christian? Like, am I, it's not even, again, it shouldn't feel like, 
like this chore, but it is responsibility. Like once you put on the name, that's why like baptism is low key like this whole thing, you know, that you're being buried and being resurrected because it is like you, this is a significant moment of you saying goodbye to who I was and to hello to this new, new version that I am. But again, Jesus knows that we are here struggling and that we sin, we still sin and we still make mistakes. So that's why he gives us another option. Jesus always gives us a way. He literally said, that's why he needs to die daily. He says, that's why we literally need to take up our cross and go. He knows that we have to consistently seek him, seek repentance. That's why he says we should literally repent every single day because when we sin, sometimes we don't even know it. Literally, the scripture says that we sin unknowingly. It be in our brains and it's like, oops, my bad. And it's just like, that's why we have to repent. So I just pray that we really just walk with confidence and we walk with peace that God is with us and that his word is true. Even when the parts that we don't understand, it's true and it holds significance. And although we don't understand, it doesn't make it not true. I think sometimes we do that too. It's like, well, I don't agree with this, so it's not true. Or this is too much work, so I don't have to listen to it. Or this is whatever. Like, But no, it's still true. The word is still true. We still have to follow it. And we're not following it in our own strength, but in his strength. And I, I want us to know as well with us as we start talking about with Jesus is that we, like, we go to apostolic church, like, Holy Ghost filled, water baptized. But I've learned, and obviously we support that, amen. What I've learned is Christianity, like, our denomination, apostol, apostolic and Pentecostal, that's a denomination. But being whatever denomination defines how you practice your faith. So there are Baptist people who believe in Jesus. There's... There's, there's probably a lot of other people. There's Trinitarians. There's like a whole bunch of denominations. They all believe in Jesus, but they practice their faith differently. So it's just important. And I, I say that not to try to twist something in our brains, but to realize that there are other people who may not practice their faith the same way, but they still believe in Jesus. And Jesus still gives them those things. So I don't want us to be like, oh, we're apostolic, so Jesus gives only us salvation. No, nah, he's given those other people salvation too. You know, and that's like a little slippery soap. But I don't want us to feel like I. At least I think sometimes we, as like Pentecostal people, we just feel like we're just unmatched. We wear our full white gowns, whiter than snow. The lamb couldn't touch me. Like, like I'm whiter than all of y'all. Like, don't play. And it's like, no, the same grace that they need is the same grace I need. The same mercy that they Jesus gave them is giving me. So we shouldn't have this this cockiness or this holier than now attitude because we're all saved by his grace, saved by his mercy, and that's that's the only way that we're gonna make it through. So Jesus gives these things to us. Um, so again, he gives us salvation, wisdom, friendship, eternal life, refinement, and peace. Amen. So I'm super grateful that you all listened, and I hope you are going home with something. Um, so if you can all stand as we close. Um, and I want, I should have said at the beginning, I forgot to, and I still want us to close. If we can all go around and quickly share who now, I wish you did this before, but now with what do you know, who is Jesus to you? So you don't use one of those words, but in one word, Jesus is blank. And then just tell me, and then I'm going to ask our pastor to close us off in prayer. Amen? Okay, Izzy, start us off. Who is Jesus? Jesus is hmm, your favorite. <laughs> Danny, I don't think Danny is upset. <laughs> he can be your everything too. <laughs> Right. Go ahead, Daddy. 
everything. Um, Jesus is, to me, a void filler. Because I really think that, like, someone said this on YouTube. <laughs> Not YouTube. Um, it was the other TikTok. That there's, like, a God-shaped heart, like, a God-shaped hole in all of us, and only he can fill it. He's, he's my void filler. Because if, if, he, if he didn't fill it, it would just be like a hole. Empty. Empty. Right. A vessel. No, and that's what we really are, you guys. We're literally just empty. We're just some vessels. Without Jesus, we just would be out here floating. But. <laughs> for real. So, amen. Thank you all for sharing. Clap for who Jesus is. So tonight, again, just go home thinking about Jesus. And I say the same thing all the time, but it's making sure that you're filling your spirit with things like him. Like, literally, like, if you're listening to trap music the whole week, you're going to be in a trappy mood. Like, you can't. <laughs> I feel like we be confused sometimes. But, like, if you literally, like, duh, 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 like that's what you're going to be on. Like, if you're watching shows that are just sad and depressing, you're going to be sad and depressed. If you're watching a whole bunch of love movies, you're going to be wanting to boo really badly. So don't watch that. Like, just exactly. And like Daddy said today, what we worship, we become. And we be worshiping things without even knowing. But, like, hello. So, again, if Jesus is these things to you, and if you're grateful for that, live that out. Out loud. Period. Okay, come back. Amen. Come on and give God the praise for your president. Amen. Amen. That was some good teaching and uh, I'm so grateful. Come on, let's lift our hands, young people, and bless the Lord. Jesus is my salvation. He gives salvation. He gives wisdom. He gives friendship. He gives eternal life. He gives refinement. I was hoping you would do a little bit more about that because I think one of the things that is happening in our world is we become so crass. So, can I use the word on social media? Ghetto. There's a, there's a clip. After we finish, I'm going to pull up a clip of this woman preaching. And she, apparently this prophet um, said something about her husband. And so she went, and she went on, no, we're going to play it after. And it, it it, it, it is not ghetto. It's not ghetto. It was, it was inappropriate. Um, and uh, the, I like that because it's, it's not normally something that is said in this type of presentation. That he refines you. That means he, he, he brings you down to the, to, the, to the place where you reflect his, his, his character. And the Bible says... A bruised reed he shall not break. One of my favorite scriptures, which means that if something is down, he doesn't make it worse, but he lifts it up. You know, a bruised reed is symbolic of something that's been battered by the wind, battered by the rain, and it's so easy to just break it down. But he comes and he lifts up that, that, that bruised reed. And he says, a smoke and flax he shall not quench, meaning you got a, a, a fire that's um, burning, but then it's going out, it's going out. He doesn't put it out. He, he lights it back. And so if, if Christ is that, then our lives should reflect the refinement of his character. Um, when God made the earth and he looked, he said it was good. When you look at your work, your life, is it good? Refinement. I, I love that. Amen. And I love the, the whole thing. And I'm glad that you're attentive. Amen to the word of the Lord. Can we give God praise one more time? Lord, we just lift our hands into heavens and we thank you for this word. We thank you for these young people. Lord God, who are making a difference in their generation. Lord, would you continue to bless this youth ministry? God, I know, Lord, uh, there are many challenges that they face, but we will stand in the midst of the small and we will grow into the uh, realm of greatness through the expansion of the lives of these young people. Would you bless us tonight as we go? Would you cause these words that have been spoken over their lives to manifest in their daily living, in their thinking, in their 
uh, all that they do, we give you praise. Thank you for the gathering of these youth in this service tonight. In Jesus' name, we are so grateful, God. We're so grateful for your goodness. We're so grateful for your refinement. We're so grateful that you pull us out of Lodibar from the place of shame and disgrace. God, even though our sma or, or, or the smoking flax is, is dying. You come and you blow on us and you blow life into us. You blow breath into us. You blow strength into us, God. You lift us up when we're down and you grant us victory over the powers of darkness. Would you continue to help us? Help these young people to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. 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 Let the words of her mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Your president.